Most welcome to this session on resilient policies, uh, leveraging water for national climate planning. I'm Torgna Holmgren, I'm Executive Director of Stockholm International Water Institute, and this session is co-arranged with um, uh, IVME, uh, OECD, Global Water Partnership, uh, WMO, and uh, the background is, of course, uh, where we are here to discuss in, in Glasgow these days about the climate crisis and what we, from our perspective, could bring to both the solutions to climate crisis, but also adaptation of the climate changes that is occurring right now. And, um, well, we who are working in water, we also, of course, know that most um, uh, effects of climate change is felt through either too much or too little water. But what we're discussing these very days also here in, in Glasgow is about how we can also use the water, uh, wetlands, oceans, uh, forests, landscape also to be part of the mitigation measures. I think that is also a very important part of, of ongoing discussions. Um, and now, providing a strong national policy, uh, political and policy signals means that strengthening the rule of water in strategic discussions and also policy making both for the local level and national level, or of course on the global level, for implementing disaster risk reduction and also adaptation also to achieve sustainable development. And it's important that these plans and policies um, reflect the fundamental elements that need to be in place to ensure resilient water policies addressing climate change in the country's development policy frameworks. And we know that many of the indices, I think most of the indices, they have water as part of that. I think going from that on the, on the paper to reality is also what we're going to discuss in this panel, also these very days here in, in, at the COP26. So with this session, our aim is to identify the building blocks to a strategy for resilient water policies and management to identify the benefits and challenges of some of the tools and methods to mainstream water resilience and to understand the good actions forward for the international community and all of us here to support the national level. I think this linkage is between national, local and global level is so important. Sometimes we miss that and maybe discuss to a large extent global level, but I think it all starts and ends at the local level. First, we will hear an introduction by Peter Glass, OECD, and Peter, you are running the Water Governance Initiative, uh, an, an international multi-stakeholder network um, of around 100 delegates from public, private, and um, non-for-profit sectors gathering twice a year in the policy forum to share uh, ongoing reforms and projects and lessons and good practices in support of better water governance. So, with that, I will leave the screen over to Peter Glass of OECD. Peter, you have the floor. There is a video, recorded video, so beware. <laughs> Warming of up to 1.5 degrees Celsius is now inevitable. In the face of growing risks of too much, too little, and too polluted water, Climate adaptation is needed. Building on 15 years of water wisdom, the OECD argues that harnessing the risks, but also promoting the opportunities, can be done by fostering a resilient, inclusive, sustainable and circular approach. This approach builds on the OECD principles of water governance, which aim to enhance water governance systems that help manage too much, too little, and to polluted water in a sustainable, integrated and inclusive way at an acceptable cost and in a reasonable time frame. These principles build on three mutually reinforcing pillars of effectiveness, efficiency and trust and engagement. Effectiveness is about defining clear, sustainable water policy goals and targets at all levels of government to implement those policy goals and to meet expected targets. Efficiency is about maximizing the benefits of sustainable water management and welfare at the least cost to society. And trust and engagement is about building public confidence and ensuring inclusiveness of stakeholders from across society. 
These principles were co-produced by the OECD Water Governance Initiative, the WGI, launched in 2013 as a permanent multi-stakeholder network of 100 plus members from public, private and civil society sectors. I have the honor to be the independent chair of the WGI. Going forward, this platform and similar platforms can contribute to a governance system built on trust and engagement and serve as examples to address systemic issues. A systemic approach to water is needed, given that it connects people, places and policies. Now, I myself live in the Netherlands, a low-lying, flood-prone Delta area. I serve as Delta Commissioner and in this independent capacity, I oversee the long-term measures to maintain a habitable, safe and sustainable living environment in my country. It is my conviction that water is the connecting element between all aspects of our physical environment. So as water policy makers and managers, we have to adopt an integrated, holistic, systemic approach connecting to all other transitions in the physical domain, such as climate mitigation, the energy transition, new agriculture, circular economy, and stopping biodiversity loss. Water has much to offer, but needs to be taken into account much earlier and much stronger than perhaps the water professionals and policymakers until now have been used to. I do know one thing, if the political community and the global business community do not get their act together and mitigation will fail, there will be no level of adaptation that in the long run will keep many regions and people safe from sea level rise, from storm surges and floods from the rivers. We will also experience regional disasters caused by droughts or torrential rains storms and, and, and wildfires. Torrential rains like we had in Germany, Belgium and the southern part of the Netherlands last July, with lives lost and economic damages that run in the tens of billions of euros. So I repeat, in the face of growing risks of too much, too little and too polluted water, Cities and the connecting river basins and coastal areas need to invest in climate adaptation to build resilient societies and economies. There is no time to waste. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Peter, for sharing those insights from your work in Water Integration Network. And now, and uh, on your work also in Delta, uh, Delta program. Well, now, uh, let us turn to the first panel, um, and we will discuss um, what climate change adaptation, uh, cross-cutting issues, what needs to be done to mainstream across the sectors. Um, there is an opportunity, I believe, to address adaptation by integrating key aspects um, relating to water, where recommendations have long called for increased and uh, increasing <laughs> integration. Here we will discuss important parts of strategy for resilient water policies and we will conclude by reflecting on some uh, actions forward, uh, how the international community can support uh, the national level. And as we know, water, and I guess most sectors are always often very fragmented and more integration is needed uh, for creating resilience. Um, and often governmental regulations are drafted for specific sectors with little mentioning of cross-cutting um, elements and integration of risk considerations. Um, for that to happen, an appropriate cross-cutting mandate, rules and responsibility and whole of government approach is needed. So see in that context uh, what value of water, governance, including finance mechanisms, must work across sectors and how it can work to develop mechanisms to strengthen dialogue and strategize across sectors to decide on um, priorities and look for synergies. 
to discuss this, uh, I have now with me a panel of four prominent um, uh, experts on this. Uh, Dr. Johannes Kullman, uh, you are director of the Climate and Water Department at WMO, the water, the, sorry, the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, and you are also leading your work in WMO on water and cryosphere activities and coordinating the building of a coherent global hydrological monitoring and outlook system. And your background is flood forecasting and you have worked also vast experience in hydrology practice in the national context. Uh, Jane, uh, Jane de Magvik, uh, you are the CEO of Wetlands International, an ecologist and author with 30 years of experience working internationally on the science, policy and practice of wetlands and water management. And previously you, you also worked with uh, with uh, WWF in, in, in Europe and Australia. Dr. Mark Smith, a uh, close colleague of ours, uh, a Director General of International Water Management Institute, IMI, and you have also been the Deputy Director for General Research Development at IMI before that, and you have more than 25 years of experience of research and program management uh, in water resources, agriculture, climate and sustainability, and before joining IVMI, you were at IUCN and also governor at the World Water Council. And online, we will have uh, Dr. Aditi Mukherjee. Mukherji. She is a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute, IVMI. And um, you are the coordinating lead author of the water chapter in the working group two of the IPPC and a member of core writing team of IPCC's AR6 synthesis report. So, with that, let me start with a question to all of you. Uh, what is important as part of a strategy for resilient water policies? What do we need to do differently? So, I will start with you, Johannes, if you would like to, well, address those two questions as a starting point. Thanks a lot. Tony, can, can, you, can I be heard well? Okay. So, welcome participants in the room and also online. Um, I want to um, reflect a little bit on, on what we have heard about the events that have just taken place in Central Europe because, of course, we thought always, yeah, Europe is a resilient place. We have all the technology and capability in place. And then what um, happened this summer in, in Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands was not a, a very unexpected event and it, it was not a very super... Uh, <coughs> Um, yeah, rare event either. It was just an event that fell into the wrong place so, and the reaction was not appropriate. So what we have to think about if we talk about risk is first of all, uh, risk is the probability that something happens times the impact that that something causes. So it's a flood and the impact that the flood causes or, or a natural disaster, a drought or uh, an ecologic breakdown or what you want to have. So l let's never forget this because many people are talking about risk and they think uh, only impact or only probability or so. So let's, let's uh, define that before we <coughs> start discussing a lot. And in Germany, the probability was actually not that low that that happened. And the impact was very, very big. So I overall, the risk was very high, but nobody was aware of this because we didn't have the right risk, o risk awareness in place. And if you look at the OECD water principles, it's a bit hard to fix that in one of the principles or in there is no one um, agreed way how you can motivate people to actually try to understand their risk. And I think if I want to project this onto the OECD water principles, I think uh, maybe the first principle is already uh, neglected because the, the first OECD water principle is about the roles of people and the mandates of people in the whole value chain of risk assessment and early warning and water management and water policy development. And there, I think we have seen in, in Europe that the mandates are maybe clear for the people, but not there is no overall understanding of what the different uh, functions in a resilience management mean 
overall. So the weather forecast was excellent, but the people were still drowning in their houses because the link was not made between weather, in this case, and water. And we have the same problem with climate and water. We know we are dewaterizing our environment at the moment. Yeah, <coughs> just again an example from Germany, because I'm German in Germany. Every two years we are losing the equivalent of the whole freshwater consumption of one year in Germany. So we are losing water at a rate of 0.5 from our environment as compared to what we consume in fresh water. And we did this is an enormous potential impact and the probability that this happens is one because we actually measure it already. So, but nobody talks about this, but this will have a huge impact on ecology, on the resilience that our natural systems will provide us against the extreme events about water scarcity, but also flooding events. And now what do we need to do about this? So let me close maybe in one or two minutes. I think we need to be more practical because principles are nice, but we need to practice the principles. So. OECD principle one, everybody has a mandate, fine, but please practice how in a real event case everybody needs to follow what that mandate entails because in Germany I have friends who lived in that zone. In some villages the firefighters came, knocked at the doors in the middle of the night and got the people out and in other zones it didn't happen. So drill it, practice it make it practical and tangible for every people in their daily lives because else it's just on paper and it won't work. And then my second thing is probably, so my first thing is practice it. My second thing is we need to bring together information from different sectors. And that's according to the principle number five of the OECD. So bring together water and weather and climate information. And we have just understood that in the World Meteorological Organization in the last two or three years. We were doing climate stuff unrelated to water stuff, unrelated to early warning for disasters. And that, that's an error. We will not be able to provide resilient futures with that. So we are integrating that and for that purpose we are developing the hydrological status and outlook system and the water and climate coalition that was launched here in this COP with a couple presidents and 10 UN agencies. And uh, I think those are my main two points. Practice things and make sure that information from different sectors are uh, looked at in an integrated way. Uh, thanks a lot, Johannes. And I will come back to one of the what you pointed to when it came to firefighters, different villages, because I'm from Sweden. A few years ago, we had a number of wildfires, and we were totally stuck. We didn't know how to manage it, I would say, because we had to learn from countries, uh, other countries in the EU, etc. But also, where lies the responsibility? Is it in the local, municipal, regional, or national level? I think that is an interesting part of the institutional framework. Thanks. Over to Jane, the same question. What is important as part of the strategy for resilient water policies and uh, what can we do to do it differently? Over to you. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'll probably follow on a little bit on Johannes' story of the, the recent floods in, in Germany on the, on the Rhine. But first, just to say uh, what we see is one of the biggest risks is, is that um, the link is made between climate and water, but is, is missed in terms of the the water environment, so the ecosystems which capture water, they store water, regulate water, release water, transform water throughout the landscape, if they are not included in any water assessment, then uh, it's certain they won't be included in any of the solutions. And uh, we see this as a massive gap um, in assessing risk. So we've invested some of our time and energy in different parts of the world in, in trying to to map uh, the landscape in terms of where the, the water risks are linked to the conditions of, of wetlands of all different kinds, and then to bring this into the, the policies and investment. So first thing is water resource should include the water environment. A second thing, yeah, I agree uh, in terms of, um, oh, to, to follow on your story, unfortunately in the upper tributaries of uh, Germany, there has been quite some uh, loss and drainage of wetlands and in the exact tributaries um, which 
uh, where the, this rain fell heavily. And uh, coincidentally, we have been doing modeling with some partners in Germany in this catchment. And the models do show that if those wetlands had been intact, the impact further downstream would have been much less. So yes, it would have been severe, but um, much less. So um, the second thing is, yeah, bringing knowledge together, knowledge sharing. What we have found in different parts of the world, it, it, it kind of diffuses confrontation and the blame game that goes on in a landscape of who's causing the particular water problem. So, you know, putting the knowledge together on the table and, and together through dialogue, understanding the causes of water risks in the landscape is a critical first step um, to defining possible scenarios and solutions. And what we notice is that very often this is a step which isn't invested in. So there may be investment in a hydrological uh, assessment, even modeling, very fancy stuff, but the step of actually connecting that modeling with the stakeholders in the landscape and bringing their knowledge into play, if that's missed, you don't get the buy-in, you don't get the, the working together on solutions. And then my third point would be, um, well, we've heard already what we need is a systems approach. I think we need to say what that really is and uh, you know, how do you do it? So how do you systematize a systems approach? Um, I have the suspicion that probably we're using that term and meaning different things. So I, I would really like it to be um, spelt out uh, somehow. Um, to us, it means uh, yeah, connecting understanding and actions on, on water and ecosystems with um, understanding of institutional and social processes across the same landscape and also the economic uh, systems and processes. So bringing those three types of systems together in a landscape um, can lead to uh, some solutions that you could call a systems approach. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for your comments on that. And uh, also coming back to the systems approach, I, what I believe uh, that often is missing is uh, know-how, knowledge, awareness about, uh, for instance, what we do in wetlands and what wetlands can, can contribute with when we're discussing, not we, but maybe the ultimate decision makers of what, uh, what that could bring for both uh, adaptation but also mitigation of, of, of climate change. Uh, over to Mark, uh, please, uh, your uh, comments and reflection to what is important and um, to, to well, important parts of a strategy for water resilience and what can we do to, what can we do differently in the future? P please. Great, thank you, Tony. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, what I wanted to do, and I think, it, I think it will connect into what you were just saying, Jane, is to introduce or actually reintroduce uh, a, a basic, a really simple framework for, for, for building water resilience. And, and that's something that uh, we've published before. Uh, we've just included it. We just published this brief today, which it's included in, in this. So that explains it a little more. That I can, there's copies here if people want to pick that up. And it has four components. And it's a nested framework. So the outermost component is, is about governance and, and institutions and, and participation and facilitating networks. The innermost component is about infrastructure and technologies, which, is, which tends to be where people start with resilience, right? And so that doesn't mean it's the good place to start. And, and in between that is, is data and information um, and, the, and the skills and abilities to use data and information and then and then also uh, systems diversity and the role of ecosystems in, in ensuring systems diversity. Um, so the, the, the question to ask, I think, is, is our, our, uh, our, our policies using and building on, on this basic architecture when we're talking about policies for for water resilience. So a quick example of that, which comes from Morocco, so from some work that IMI's been doing in Morocco under a program called MENA Drought. So this is uh, uh, a, a, a story of uh, managing drought in rangelands with pastoralists. It's a place where drought uh, leads to conflict between pastoralists and farmers. Um, there was a change in policy to introduce into the drought management policy 
uh, a new definition of drought called agro, for agro-pastoralist drought. We don't need to go into why and what that is, but, but then they use, there's provision for using data and maps to then trigger the declaration of drought, which then leads to uh, a implementation of a process for local institutions, so the connection between national action and local institutions, um, who are then empowered through a local permitting system to control access to the pastures which then enables protection and restoration of those pastures and the, and the natural infrastructure that they provide and, and reduce conflict and better ability to manage the risk. So it's just a quick little story about how those components fit together. Um, so part of the question too that, that you posed to us was what should we do differently? So based on that, um, four things that we should do differently. One is test our policy architecture using that simple framework. Are we, are we adequately, and you know, die, you dive into that, you're getting all sorts of complications, but are we adequately covering those four basic building blocks? Uh, within that, make sure that national policies promote and empower local institutions and, and, and networks that you need for self-organization, including networks that connect across sectors and so on, and provision that with data and information that leverages all kinds of new technologies to make that much easier and much more effective than it used to be. Um, and finally, embed within that, uh, within these approaches, facilitation of, of platforms for cooperation uh, and for implementing policies that, that help you cascade action across the scales, which is, which is really key. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Mark, and I especially I'm intrigued to continue to discuss uh, about uh, what you mentioned about institutions and data and information, I think. Nowadays, we have the tools at least to gather data, but to provide them as information for, for ourselves and decision makers. Uh, let me now turn to Aditi. Uh, you have the same basic question that uh, colleagues here in Glasgow have responded to about uh, your take on what we can do differently and what are the best policies for a more water resilient future. So, Aditi, I hope you are on the screen or on the line. Thanks. discussion and happy Diwali everyone. Um, so today in response to your question I wanted to bring in the perspective of trade-offs between adaptation and mitigation. You know we often think of water as being crucial to adaptation which is absolutely is but water also plays a very important role in mitigation and uh, what is also increasingly clear at COP and elsewhere is that we need to reduce emissions uh, on, on, a, on almost like a war footing IPCC's 1.5 degree report said that we to keep within 1.5 degrees, we need to reduce emissions by up to 45% by 2030, which means that the bulk of that have needs to happen in this decade. So it's basically mitigate now. But what I want to bring attention of this panel is that mitigation measures can actually lead to, uh, can actually in, in, some, in places uh, exacerbate water scarcity. And some studies are showing that by end of century, if mitigation measures aren't done carefully from a water perspective, it could increase water consumption withdrawal by as much as 160,000 billion um, uh, kilometer cubes, which is which is quite huge and already make, you know, already water scarce areas um, uh, like quite worse off and th thereby constrain the space for adaptation. Just to provide a few specific examples around some of the work that we are doing, but also around global literature. Um, a lot of the countries are promoting solar pumps. It's, it's an excellent technology. It lets farmers irrigate and we know irrigation in developing countries like where EMI works is really one of those tools that helps farmers to come out of poverty. But solar irrigation pumps also have a disadvantage in the terms that the zero, the cost of pumping is really like almost zero, which could lead to groundwater depletion. So here we really need to work on incentives. How do we incentivize farmers who are using solar irrigation pumps not to over exploit groundwater? And we are working on innovative models with governments, for example, in South Asia and Africa on that. Similarly, um, there's a lot of emphasis on very popular land-based mitigation measure is, for example, bioenergy crop with carbon capture and storage in short becks. 
and and becks are again great unless you are also irrigating those becks crops so again some studies are showing that becks is a good strategy to reach a 1.5 degree world but this can actually double the global area and population living under severe water stress let's not forget that almost 4 billion people currently are already living under severe water stress for at least one month in a year and we do not want mitigation to exacerbate those stresses and finally uh, we cannot talk about mitigation without talking about our forestation reforestation is very popular measure it's a good measure that's the reason why it's popular there are several benefits from water also water quality but aggressive reforestation without due consideration to location can similarly exacerbate water scarcity can also have very negative impacts on food prices so basically to sum i want to say that water also needs to play an important part within the mitigation community the mitigation community needs to talk to the water communities to understand the water footprints better uh, thank you so much and back to you tony uh, thanks a lot and thanks a lot for also bringing up the the issue of well, i like call the pol the pol pol probabilities the possibilities i mean of, of forest and we know that uh, the declaration that was uh, uh, what uh, signed yesterday i think harry in, in glasgow of um, cutting or stop deforestation and just attended a seminar on forest water and access and that is quite a close linkage and correlation there for sure now johannes you refer to the risks and the, what uh, your home country was exposed to this summer with with floods and how do we inform policy development policy makers with the right data on risks I guess we were taken by surprise to some extent at least this summer but do you see any linkage there to have this forecast data and I have one follow up question for you also <laughs> about the WMO recently uh, shared a report that uh, combined the pandemic and climate change that the next pandemic can be the droughts in the future of the world but let's start with the risk and then the the might be new pandemic which is droughts over to you Yeah, thanks. Do you want me to talk half an hour, Tony? <laughs> I, I will try to make that short. Okay. The, the, how can we make sure that we analyze our risk better? Is really to uh, it, in WMO we have just, uh, or our member states have just decided uh, two months ago that we should have a new data policy internationally applied and and the goal is to really make sure that those data that are relevant for people to protect their lives and their livelihoods in the end should be a global public good it should be impossible that somebody does not receive a warning because i don't know there's a disconnect between the met agency and the civil protection agency or that there's a disconnect between the government with their monitoring systems and the private sector who has a lot of additional data that is really valuable and especially if we go to the environment context there that is even more striking because most of the water related environmental data is actually private holders of this data and they don't want to share it because it's uh, an economic good or what not so i think <clears throat> that's important we we need to sh join our voices to say the data that is relevant for survival not only for people but also for the planet or for environment that that must be a global public good and uh, i mean in the european union we have some <coughs> steps towards this with uh, uh, environmental data legislations but we must work together to make that happen and if we have that then it will be much easier for us to connect uh, climate outlooks with hydrological outlooks or disaster outlooks with uh, in a multi hazard context where we address droughts or dam breaks or uh, other natural hazards together so that that's number one on, on it's really on data policy or end on the culture to live that not only in that, that's not only a political thing that's a cultural thing where uh, administration government but also the private sector uh, and people will need to come together and <coughs> on the second thing about the droughts yeah of course uh, droughts will increase we we know that even if we stop emitting now we will have uh, more severe droughts in the next 
60 to 100 years. So the, the, we are set on that course. We uh, be at the moment in the Indus River Basin, the population depends almost 50% on meltwater from glaciers. And that's a non-renewable, that, that's going to go away. So the drought situation for hundreds of millions of people on the planet in the next couple hundred years will be m much, much more dire than it is now. And, and we need to, that's why I had this example about losing water from the environment. We need to start now to re-water mm -hmm. our environment to provide a healthy food supply and ecosystems. It's just not acceptable that we drain more soils and that we have uh, uh, less biology in the soils, less uh, 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 organic material, that we still uh, uh, build systems that are not, so to say, uh, you know, in Germany, any light post we construct, there is an environmental uh, uh, analysis, impact analysis. But do we have that for uh, draining an agricultural area? No, we don't. So that, that's our, our problem, and we need to work together on that. Uh, thanks. Most, most interesting, um, the perspective, both gloomy and possibilities for, for the future. Jane, building what you uh, are they doing on a daily basis, but also your first response here, what, what do you think we can do to, uh, well, lift and also enable the implementation of more water resilience uh, on, on, on a national level and building on that also what is um, what should be a action agenda for the international international um, community to support that yeah well thank you again i want to follow on a little bit from johannes's line um, it starts with the data and the knowledge so i i think that um, in knowing where the the natural water infrastructure exists in the countries, um, in the landscape, this is the start. You know, that, that should be, uh, that information should be there. And then based on that, the, the values of those areas should be made more explicit. And this was actually called for, well, years ago in the Sendai uh, framework for disaster risk reduction. But I don't see it, it happening. So. Um, yeah, we're actually quite concerned about uh, the infrastructure response to uh, increasing water risks, whether it's floods or, or droughts, and concerned that it, if we're not careful, this could even make the situation worse, simply because the existing natural infrastructure is, is not uh, known about or valued in the system. So to be very practical, um, we need to yeah, completely change or add to the system of cost-benefit analysis for infrastructure development mm -hmm. in a way that makes sure you look beyond the, the very local environment and you look to um, what's happening in terms of the long-term changes, costs and benefits of ecosystems and um, how would that affect mm -hmm. water resilience. This opens up the door then and incentivizes uh, infrastructure solutions which may be a mixture of green and grey or they may be actually completely green as in mm -hmm. restoring big wetland areas that were lost mm -hmm. but we need to change the institutional mechanisms and uh, protocols for that um, and that follows on um, to the procurement and contracting yeah. levels where equally uh, mm -hmm. that this lets us down um, nearly every time and you know, we talk to companies who would happily um, build into their, their project design green infrastructure solutions, <coughs> recreating wetlands as part of the picture, but it's not incentivized in the procurement process. In fact, it's, it, it even makes them fall outside of, of the bid um, or it puts them out of the position of winning a bid. So I think there's some, we need to tear up the existing uh, processes and reshape them to enable this joined up approach that was mentioned many times in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and a key other very practical thing is, is scenario analysis. Mm -hmm. So we've seen, for example, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where there are some vast uh, wetland systems, um, which are really, yeah, the engines of the local economy, um, vital for people's survival uh, in times of drought, for example, but they're, they're getting smaller. But we've tried and tested there some pretty simple um, decision-making 
systems linked with scenarios, which just bring to light the opportunities to, um, to alter the location and design of water infrastructure, mm -hmm. to minimize downstream impacts, and to make the case for sustaining and even restoring some of the wetland systems which are there. Mm -hmm. So it's, not, um, it's nothing very technical or special. It's, it's very practical. But mm -hmm. these kinds of ways of working need to be mainstreamed. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's what we need to bring. And then the, that's the last thing, is that uh, we need to think big and long term for water resilience. You know, we mustn't jump to the local, solving a local water problem with a local technical solution, which is what we're doing now. So we need to zoom out into the landscape, think big and long term, and plan resilience uh, over long time frames in this systemic way. Uh, thanks a lot. And coming back to you, Mark, what you mentioned in your intervention about institutions, um, the setup, uh, the date, etc. Uh, your reflection, what uh, Jane and uh, Johannes has uh, also shared with us, but also a more specific question. When I have had discussions with um, uh, some of the companies, big companies on the private sector, they claim that nowadays uh, with modern technology ai you can do much different with the data that you have at hand for us starting school maybe a few years ago we had to analyze it uh, uh, in another way but now with big data you can make it to information do you see that happening in our sector that we can transform big data into information that we could also foresee future risks that we cannot do uh, 10 years ago yeah i think it's um i think it's coming I think it's coming fast, and I and I think it could really um, it, it revolutionize is a strong word, but it could really revolutionize the way that the kinds of problems that we're talking about are informed, so that so that we're able to approach them in much in a much more deeply informed way at multiple levels than than has been the case in the past, especially obviously especially in in contexts which are, which are data poor. So that, that problem is changing very rapidly. And I, and I agree that, um, sorry, but one of the things that I've heard s uh, someone who knows much more about these things than me say is that, that actually with these technologies, water is very slow in coming to the table. And, and so that, that um, the, the role that data is playing in catalyzing that real change and retooling of, of approaches um, what is a little little bit behind the curve on that? It's the way I've understood it, and and I certainly think that uh, your the basic part of your question about what's the role of at the international level uh, in helping nas national policies to be to be more res resilient focused, and I think data and information is a is a critical part of that. I think a second component is is as I mentioned before is getting better at at facilitating. Um, those cross-sector and cross-scale cooperation platforms, and making those problem-focused, so you so you get on with with solving real problems, and doing that in ways that that are bold and big. I mean, that's the era that we're moving into. It's bold and big, and and part of that bold and big agenda, I think, has to be agriculture, and we have to talk about agriculture in water, which, given the 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 footprint of agriculture in, in, the, in, in the water resources and in water resilience problems, we just don't talk about enough. So we need to, we need to you know, it's like, we, okay, everybody, we need to sit down and really talk about agriculture. We need agriculture to come to that table too. Um, and so how do we drive that at the international level? And, and just to leave you then with, with just, um, uh, an example of that is if you compare what came out of the UN Food Systems Summit in, in uh, September in regard to water, which was very, very little. Water was kind of sunk down at level three or four in their action framework. Compare that with what the IPCC report said in August, and they're, they're not on the same planet, right? They're not on the same planet, so we have to, we have to close that gap and do that really urgently. Yeah. Thank you.
So, okay, thanks. Uh, that, that's most interesting, but also frightening. <laughs> uh, now back to Aditi. Uh, your reflection on what you have heard from colleagues here in Englav, Skovenot. Uh, also, what do you see as the potential synergies and trade-offs uh, of different mitigation measures from a voter footprint perspective? Aditi. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, I, I kind of talked about uh, that in my earlier one, and now perhaps I just wanted to emphasize, uh, uh, c continue what Mark was talking about. That's something that comes as a surprise to me every single time about how central water is to the entire climate change, how every aspect of the water cycle is being affected due to climate change, and that came out very clearly in the IPCC working group one report that came out in August. But what, uh, but then we are also, we also know that when we, uh, we, we, we in, in, as a part of the assessment, we have also done a meta analysis of adaptation interventions, like a global review. And it's clearly showing that people are adapting to uh, climate change. Uh, and most of that adaptation is happening for water related hazards like floods and droughts. Much of those adaptation is happening vis-a-vis -vis agriculture because agriculture uses, you know, the maximum consumptive use of water. But yet what I find very surprising is this disconnect, the very fact that it's, it's water hazards that people are adapting to, yet the adaptation community often does not think water is central to their work. And therefore, it makes me so happy to see that GCA actually uh, actually has a has an entire water theme that's looking at water and adaptation. I think that's a very, very timely move. Similarly, as I talked before, uh, when it comes to the mitigation community, uh, there's a very vibrant mitigation community, obviously, but mitigation community also doesn't necessarily think from a water lens. So we as water professionals, I think, have a, a have quite a big, a big uh, job in front of us to make sure that we are a part of the adaptation discussions. I mean, uh, I, I can't even imagine why water is not being more central to the entire adaptation, even when we know all the NDCs of the governments are around water and adaptation. And also similarly, the water community needs to be much more embedded in the mitigation work that's going on. So basically, we just need to be more embedded in those two climate change adaptation and mitigation communities. And it almost seems like there are parallel tracks and we aren't talking enough with each other. So back to you. Uh, thanks a lot. And I have give the panel uh, one final question for the time being at least. Um, and I give you one minute each. Uh, our organizations are jointly together to raise the awareness and also the impact in the discussions here on climate change uh, conferences, the COPs, about water. And we have been working for quite some time to get us there. And my question is, are we there yet? But let me just mention, I learned yesterday, I haven't checked myself, but water has not been part of the mainstream climate change discussion thing since COP1. It's gradually coming there. And what I learned yesterday, and I have to check it, I think, is that in the most recent IPCC report, Water is mentioned, and listen now, 3,000 times. Maybe appendices, but we have to check back on that. But that is interesting, I think, that now, slowly and finally, I think we're getting there. But my question, panel, are we there? What is needed to even have water as part of the final, final, the, f the future solutions on climate? Uh, if you have some reflection, Johannes, Jane, Mark, and Aditi. Okay, let's try this one. <laughs> so I think uh, we are not yet there because, of course, if you drive at 200 an hour against the wall, your first reflection is to break the car. And that's what we're doing with mitigation. I mean, I am totally on that. That's fine with me. And then while you are braking, you might also think, okay, what's next? And that's the water debate. What's how do I get out of this car when I have stopped it? And and I think we are we are on the way of having a chance to stopping the car and thinking about, okay, how do we get out of this car? So maybe a car is not a good uh, example in a climate conference, but uh, I think it just took really uh, 
so long to agree on the Paris Agreement, which I think is a good, is really a good instrument that we have. And I think uh, I am seeing water coming up. The next COP will very, very likely be in Egypt, which uh, probably will set the path to more water discussions. We know that the adaptation discussion is taking more s speed. So I see that it's going in the right way. It's too slow, but at least it's going in the right way. Uh, thanks. And what I heard from colleagues is that the COP27 will be water-focused as well. Uh, Jane. Yeah, I think uh, two remarks. First, uh, make water popular somehow. You know, like some, somehow trees became popular and then everyone jumps in and makes uh, pledges. It's uh, one way. But I, I would say make sure the water isn't seen as something extra to the climate agenda. It is the climate agenda, or it should be part of core part of the climate agenda and it's also the water resiliency is not about giving up things it's certainly not about giving up on economic uh, development either uh, rather it's a way to secure resilient uh, economic development so make it a good news story and, and not leave the politicians feeling oh there's something else that we need to work on as well as uh, greenhouse gas emissions yeah mark um, yeah, I'd like to pose a challenge, actually, in response to your question. So, so given the gravity of, of the water challenge that the world faces under climate change and the fact that, that that gravity, as you refer to, Johannes, it only deepens as we go forward into the next decade. And as you said, Torni, we've had some success in bringing our various institutions together to, to be engaging and speaking with kind of one voice. Is the institutional setup for water in the international system, is it just too weak for this agenda, right? And therefore, what do we have to do to address that weakness, to overcome those weaknesses in our, in our institutional setup? Um, so. Interesting. And Aditya, you have the final word on this question. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I think we are getting there. The very fact that this was the first time I believe that uh, COP has a dedicated water pavilion, that the Global Commission on Adaptation has a water track. I mean, these are all positive developments, IPCC, with which I am involved. Uh, I, I am uh, the, uh, one of the lead uh, coordinating lead authors of the water chapter, and I can assure you that perhaps 3,000 times maybe an underestimate for that matter. If you combine all the six IPCC reports that have come out in the AR6 cycle, there's a lot of water in there, including in the summary reports. So I think we are moving there, but there is still a lot of disconnect. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not there quite yet, but it's obvious that the moment adaptation becomes a part of the local governments, that's where a lot of the action will be, because it's the local communities that are feeling the water stress. and. Most of the people are experiencing climate change through water. They're experiencing climate change through droughts and floods. So there is no way that water will be kept out of the agenda for much longer. And, and we, we just have our work cut out there. So, yeah. so with that, Matthew. we close the first segment of our session this afternoon. And thanks a lot for sharing your very interesting and insightful reflections, ideas, and what to be done, and what we should do in the future. So, Johannes, Jane, Mark, and Aditya. Now, let's move on. Um, apart from specific principles for water resilience, what tools and uh, guidelines exist to mainstream water resilience at national level, and how has it worked so far? Uh, many countries have taken the first step towards uh, mainstreaming climate adaptation in policy documents, we know but it remains a lot to be seen how that will be done and fully mainstreamed in the real life and the relevant policy framework. To discuss this, uh, I would like to introduce four new panelists. Um, we have Dr. Paul Sayers, um, a founding partner of um, Sayers & Partners, a consultancy specializing in management of water environment and its associated risk. And previously, he was a director of HR uh, Wallingford Limited. We have um, Kidane Jambere and Tirune, technical advisor for the Global Water Partnership, uh, Water, Climate and Development Program. 
and uh, Dr. Lina Blom, City of Gothenburg in Sweden, and uh, your R&D manager and strategic advisor on sustainable waste and water in the City of Gothenburg. And you're also an adjunct professor in resilient water and wastewater systems in the Division of Water Environment, Technology Research, and uh, Theme Hazards and Risks for Drinking Water Resources and Treatment at the Chalmers uh, Technical University in Sweden. And also, Imelda uh, Bakudo, you are uh, uh, working for the Association of Southeastern Asian Nations, as we know, ASEAN. And it's a 10 member state for strengthening regional and international policies to gain wider access to climate finance. So with that, I'm not sure that any one of you are here in Glasgow, so I think we will have you online. And I would uh, ask uh, a first bunch of questions that I would like all of you to reflect upon. And the, the first one is, what practical experience and tools can you share with us on how to mainstream water resilience? So practical experience of tools and measures. And also with that, what are the benefits and challenges um, which could inform a strategy for resilient water policies? But let's start with the tools and measures and, the, and we come. We, uh, it's working? Yeah. Uh, tools, measures first, and second round, policies. So with that, I start with um, Lena Blum of Sita Gothenburg. Tools and measures uh, in your day-to-day -day work in running uh, water resilience in the uh, city of Gothenburg, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to be part of this panel and to reflect on water resilience, which is uh, very urgent questions. Uh, I'm from Gothenburg, the west coast of Sweden, uh, and in Sweden we do we we haven't had so many crises water related before, but it's coming the, the couple of last years definitely. Uh, and one question we are asking ourselves is must a crisis happen before we, we do anything? And how do we act ahead? Um, so what do we do? Uh, we're trying to build up knowledge and models. And we, I think it's very important to see benefits and values of um, why we should do measures. We need political anchor. Uh, we need to base, as somebody said in the uh, previous panel, that it's very important to, to look at the cost-benefit analysis. I think that too, uh, to look at societal value, uh, and I think value of water must be higher. Uh, it must also include all parts, uh, including social, ecological and economical aspects, to get decisions ahead. If we don't have the crisis in our own city, we need to, to model it and to see how to do this. And it takes time. Uh, it's also, we need to build this awareness um, what we are using. We have joined the IWA uh, concept of water-wise cities. Our city signed that a couple of years ago. We use the UN Agenda Development Goals. In Sweden, we have something called uh, Swedish Environmental Goals. And we have the Sendai framework. We use those kind of tools uh, to get in place some pressure that we need to do something. And in Europe, we also have a couple of directives, water framework directive with quality, or the floods, floods directive, and a couple more. And they are actually not in line with each other all the time. Uh, they end up in Sweden in different silos, different authorities. We need to prevent that. Uh, and also it's a global problem. Uh, it's, uh, but it's actually now a climate adaptation goal in the IPCC conclusion. That is good. So we have a lot to refer to, but we need to break it down uh, and to get it back home and to see what we can do. And a very central part for us is to, 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 uh, to focus on a catchment area. It's definitely not a municipal problem. It's a regional or even bigger problem. And uh, measures should be done where, where they are best done. That could be upstream uh, for downstream benefits. And, and then the cost should be uh, according to that somehow, which is difficult. And, uh, but a lot is ending up, how should we finance this? And who is responsible? So a holistic view 
is very necessary and we need to get away away from silos on all levels up to the national level and maybe at european level as well um, and it's also very important that the ones that will get the benefit should pay for for it somehow so this financial model i'm asking for that <laughs> and we need to coordinate water questions um, on one part it's very differentiated as i said in silos we need to bring it back somebody needs to be uh, responsible for the holistic view actually so maybe i'll stop there so far <laughs> uh, thanks a lot lena and uh, of course what you mentioned about uh, lack of policy coherence or policy incoherence of course that is um, quite a challenge i think all over the place now, turning to Africa, um, Kidane, uh, you are based, I guess, in uh, some of the DWP, Global Water Partnership offices in, in Africa. What experience can you share with us of when it comes to tools and measures? Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the opportunity. Um, I'll be sharing um, uh, some of our experience working in Africa, uh, working with many stakeholders, because um, Africa is trying to connect um, water issues, climate issues, and development issues. They're very much connected when it comes to Africa. And then our experience is, how, what, what does it require? So I'll be trying to uh, share with you what we are doing, what we have been doing in, in, in Africa, and trying to connect water climate development program. So we have an initiative, a pan-African level initiative or program called Water Climate Development Program. And the first thing is, if you want to build resilience, um, water security in Africa, the first thing is we need a high level of political commitment and a very high level of integration of water climate development issues at a very high level. So from that perspective, um, I will be sharing one case in, in Africa, which is Ghana, which actually managed to integrate issues of water security and also climate resilience in its national development and sector development planning processes. So that's a very high level political commitment, but also action uh, in terms of making sure that water issues, climate issues are integrated as part of their national development planning, sector development planning. And, and for that to happen, the African Union, African Minister's Council on Water, AMCAO, developed what we call it a strategic framework, strategic framework for building climate resilience and also water security in Africa. So based on that strategic framework, Ghana actually managed to integrate um, water issues and climate issues at a very high national development planning, sector development plan. So that's a very interesting kind of case, um, high commitment and taking action at that level. Then the second is around, because many countries in Africa are actually developing or formulating national adaptation plans as part of implementing the Paris Agreement. So the issue is how do we make sure water is also integrated in the national adaptation planning process? Then my second case is actually from Zambia, because Zambia is intentionally um, integrating water issues in its formulation of national adaptation plan. So uh, Zambia has a two-phased approach of its developing national adaptation plan. So the first phase is actually developing overall framework national adaptation plan, and which provides a overall framework, institutional coordination, and so on. But the second one is actually focusing around bringing water as a connector to water sensitive sectors to develop a water focused national adaptation planning. So it's actually a very interesting issue. Again, as part of doing some climate action on the ground or maybe at adaptation action at national level, then you have to make sure also integrating water as part of um, your climate change adaptation uh, planning and program. So that's another case from from Zambia. And for that to happen, actually, there was a, um, what you call it, a guideline. Um, we, we call it water supplement to national adaptation planning, um, addressing water issues in the national adaptation planning, which GWP with other partners developed that guideline. So if countries are interested, actually, they can follow that guideline to make sure water is integrated in the national, national adaptation planning process. Then 
let's assume that we have the policy, national planning, development plans, we have national adaptation plans, water is already integrated. And then the next steps actually taking the actual action, the actual adaptation action on the ground. So my third case will be from Uganda, where Uganda actually implemented um, in terms of collecting water on the ground, um, linking to climate change adaptation action. So Uganda's case is a small local level climate change adaptation action where um, it, it identified a small catchment area through applying the IWRM principles or OECD kind of uh, principles. And then um, it, it, it tried to demonstrate how water is actually connected to a number of socioeconomic development demands at that particular hydrological boundary being energy or agriculture or water source management or nature conservation. So that's like a participatory platform and also establish a local structure for managing that, that catchment area and then um, local adaptation planning and implementation. So currently actually communities are actually owning process, the process and implementing climate change adaptation um, action. So I think I will stop here trying to cover um, action at policy planning level how to integrate water in the national development plans, and then linking water into your adaptation programs and plans, and finally water in taking local adaptation action on the ground. Back to you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Kedana, to share with us some uh, real life experience from um, uh, uh, some of your countries that you are, are working with in, in, um, in Africa. Now, uh, Paul Sayers, you have uh, a long experience of international experience of all aspects of flood risk management and coastal management, um, both in China, Europe, and the US. And um, if I may pose the question to you, what can you share with us some experience on flood management from around the world, what you've been doing in this context? So over to Paul Sayers. Yes, thanks uh, for that, and really pleased to be here. Hopefully, you can you can see my screen, okay? So I'll I'll just be saying a bit about the strategic approach and some of the tools we've been using. Um, and I thought I'd start with with just one that illustrates uh, some work we did for the UK climate change risk assessment around the changing managed risk. So how much risk we are expecting to manage by 2080? So adaptation our adaptations by 2080, and this graph is showing it from present day to the future, how large that adaptation uh, risk managed will be. And with that will be a significant cost. Uh, so it's, and if we simply focus on conventional risk reduction approaches to achieving that level of risk reduction by 2080s, then that's gonna be a wasted opportunity. So these type of tools are showing us a, how that risk might change, and B, really highlighting that a lot of money will go to adaptation. Let's make the best from it uh, and think of through those multiple benefits that they might achieve. I also thought I'd share this one, some work for all of Africa that we have been doing with WWF uh, that is highlighting that incremental adaptation, if we think about incremental adaptation, which is pretty easy to think about, that's not going to be enough and transformational change will really be needed. And this map is showing uh, how restoring, if we were able, forest loss across Africa, how that might change sediment management. And it's also highlighting this idea that we have to break this cycle of a bias to build, as we call it. That from adaptation, people tend to reach for structural responses. There's a real bias to build in adaptation terms. So promoting whole system, natural infrastructure, can, uh, alongside conventional responses can really help. And this, it, this map is illustrating the role that, I uh, say, forest restoration might provide in managing sediments as part of the water uh, cycle goals. And we also uh, did some work about radical change. So adaptation, again, is quite often thought of in that incremental sense. But there will be many places around the world that uh, radical uh, adaptations will be needed. So this is some work we did for the Global uh, Climate Foundation, looking at how coastal risks, again in the UK in this case, uh, might change. 
And there are places where a real relocation is going to be needed, not only in uh, developing countries, but also in developed countries. There's a real need for that in some places. But where that is needed, it's going to take time to plan and communities and, and maybe even larger conurbations are going to be, need to be supported in making that change. So it's not about keeping the status quo, but in some places, real radical change will be needed. So as a, a, a final uh, reflection, um, I was involved in a livable cities program um, and a flood resilience program and ecosystem health programs and quite often they're thought are they rivals or are they allies those things and what a lot of our work highlights is that uh, basically they're not distinct from each other you can't have one of those without the other they are uh, bedfellows and there's a real challenge to us to think about how we bring those all those things together and there are some tools and this is some golden rules we develop with wwf to try and help us uh, bring those uh, items together but don't think about them as rivals but think about them as allies and then we can start uh, adapting in a much more holistic sense okay back to you uh, thanks a lot and that was most interest interesting i will come back to you about your your stepwise approach from uh, adaptation to incremental to radical change. I have a follow-up question on that, at least one. And now, uh, may I also now introduce and um, invite uh, Imelda Bakudo uh, from ASEAN uh, in Asia uh, to give uh, some examples of tools and practices that you are dealing with in the Climate Resilience Network in, um, in your part of the world. So uh, Imelda, you have the screen and the floor and the bird. Am I muted? Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity for the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network to give examples of, of metrics or tools and policies that we are using uh, within the ASEAN region. The ASEAN Climate Resilience Network is a knowledge exchange platform that gives technical advice to the Association of Southeast Asian Nation on climate smart agriculture. And within this climate smart planning, we hopefully lead to some nature-based water management. Concretely, we have produced several guidelines as a result of best practices sharing amongst the 10 member countries of Southeast Asia. Some of these guidelines, uh, these guidelines have been endorsed by the 10 ministers of agriculture and showcases um, best practices such as alternate wetting and drying in rice production. As you know, in this region, rice is a very important crop. Um, there's also promotion of stress tolerant rice varieties and recently Philippines, for example, has been trying to promote cascading rainwater catchment systems. There's a lot of long coastlines as well. So water management is very important and we have a lot of small islands. So there's also small island resiliency studies that we are promoting, such as carrying capacities. This has all resulted to policy guidelines for member states who might be needing it. Um, some of the challenges we are facing in this, in terms of guiding the 10 member states, have already been expressed by predecessor speakers in this, in this webinar. It's the lack of, uh, it's the cross-sectoral coordination is very important. You might be, uh, it might be news to you, but within the ASEAN as an institution, there are 300 working groups on forestry, agriculture, energy, small medium enterprise but there is no working group on fluid uh, topics such as soil and water for example so this so this as you might understand is a very puts water management in a very challenging position but despite that i would like to say that um, the asean negotiating group for agriculture is right there in glasgow um, trying to jointly uh, shape the future of what we call the Coronivia Joint Work for Agriculture. 
I think the previous speaker, Mark Smith, has said that the battleground for water management would lie in the agriculture sector. And Coronivia Joint Work for Agriculture is actually the landmark decision. Finally, agriculture was given some space within UNF C. And despite the challenges we are facing, the 10 member states of um, Southeast Asia are over there in Glasgow in a hybrid manner. Some of us are in virtual rooms. Some of us couldn't enter these virtual rooms. Some of the countries are in Glasgow. And we are hoping that the policies being shaped under Coronida Joint Work for Agriculture, amongst many topics within this agriculture set, uh, um, framework, would really look into nature-based water management. And so I hope everyone will, I'll, I'll leave my, my sharing uh, in this way. These negotiators will go back to Southeast Asia and we will continue to look for implementation of this Coronivia Joint Work for Agriculture of which water management is a crucial issue. But despite what may happen with the negotiations, I would like to also share an example that the Southeast Asian nations have already come together to access climate finance, for example, which is one of the challenges being mentioned in scaling up good practices. And so, um, we are presenting and we have successfully lodged an application for multi-country proposal that will open up and align our agriculture investments with climate change frameworks at the national level. So I think that is it from my side. These are examples from our region. Uh, thanks a lot, Imelda. Now I have some follow-up questions uh, to panelists in this round as well. And I start with Lena Bloom in Gothenburg. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the lack of policy coherence or the policy incoherences. From your perspective, what would be the most immediate policy coherence measure that you would like to see that doesn't make your life and life of uh, citizens of Gothenburg worse when it comes to handling water and water resilience? Over to you, Lena. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we have been working with this kind of questions for a couple of <laughs> decades, more or less, uh, since we uh, was aware that uh, flood we have this flood risk in our city. Uh, we've been trying to, to see how, how should we move forward, how should we work with this. So uh, we have been doing massive attack, uh, communicating, uh, networking with different people and also doing that um, cross silos. Uh, so we do have a uh, rising awareness uh, and, and we are getting some political anchorness. So I want to be a little bit positive also. So we are getting forward in this. Uh, and in my city, it's mostly flood problem also that we are handling, but also of course, quality, uh, water quality problems. So, so we are working towards more blue-green nature-based solutions for stormwater, but for flooding, there are other levels on the measures that we need there. But we do have some anchorness and awareness, and we have also been working with our organization uh, that there are different departments uh, with different uh, um, goals uh, and we do now more or less have an agreement of cloudburst protection in the city is that it's not so silo wise it's more oh, holistic in the city but uh, we will not get the whole way but we'll get some some place with this because we still need this financing it's still a lot of money to, to deal with uh, cloudbursts um, and also um, um, the quality of the water so but we are working in parallel with um, policy influencing by lobbying to affect different authorities and uh, decision makers to see what we can do both in national level but also European level through Euro cities and other networks we're working together and we can also note that uh, the legislation and policies in, Euro uh, in Europe they are uh, transferred differently in different countries. So in Sweden, we need to look into this and how should we interpret uh, 
the water framework directive for instance how we do <laughs> implement it in one way other countries in other ways so maybe we do it uh, too strict and some other might be on the opposite way maybe so that's something that we need to reflect on but we are definitely on the way uh, i would say here in our city and um, but it's it, it is taking a long time uh, to do this and to build this awareness well, we we didn't have this big crisis in my city, but we we are looking around the globe and and Europe, of course. So we we know now, and we have this uh, after the pandemic as well. So I think we are we are on the time timeline, uh, and it should be possible. So I want to be a little bit positive here now, actually. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Lena, <coughs> for sharing your your views about that. Now turning to Kidan and, uh, in Africa, um, uh, some personal reflection. I have myself been a, a climate COP negotiator a few years ago, and sometimes, but well, I do see a disconnect between the discussions, the global level, and what is taking place on the local level. Maybe that gap is shrinking now. But what I have found over the years, maybe the most impactful tool I have the, uh, have experienced is learn by your neighbor learn by your neighbor is that happening in your part of the world that you see what your neighbor is doing the neighbor country maybe municipality when it comes to water resilience how does it work in in your part of the world um, kidane thank you very much thank you for that yes um, i think that's very critical for one thing is um we, we don't have to reinvent invent the, the wheel basically so we have to learn from one to the other and for that purpose we have actually different um partnerships we we call them we, we have partnerships for for policy influencing partnerships for actual practice for knowledge exchange, learning, um, and and, um, and and facilitating some kind of knowledge exchange and capacity development. So yeah, uh, that's the whole purpose actually. So what we do is we capture some of the lessons from different countries, um, kind of um, capturing what is a good practice. Sometimes you also recommend um, bad practices so that we cannot actually do maladaptation, for example. So that one is also a platform facilitating in terms of knowledge experience sharing between the African countries. Um, so that's actually happening. We have to do a lot more. Um, we have different pa partners for capacity building, knowledge sharing, information exchange, and also for policy influencing process in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Now uh, turning to Paul Sayers. Uh, uh, I'm representing Stockholm International Water Institute and we on an annual basis award the Stockholm Water Prize. And a few years ago we had a recipient from, uh, or a winner, from South Africa and he claimed that uh, once upon a time the mighty law decided that the mines should be at one part of the country and the water in another part of the country. You have a, you have a, you have a challenge there. There are other countries in the world where population live in one part of the country and water is another part of the country. Now, coming to my question about what you mentioned about radical change. My question, are we not seeing that already now or in the years to come? And the change is migration. People move what from, from water scarce area. Are you seeing that coming? Yeah, I think that, that certainly that's right. From a, uh, I see that coming from a, a, a drought scarcity perspective. Uh, I, I was particularly thinking here about the flood perspective of uh, driven migration that we might see and the radical change being we quite often focus our risk reduction efforts on we can manage the hazard or we can manage the vulnerability. We rarely worry about let's radically change the exposure that we have. That's quite often a bit of a given. So we, uh, we worry about the hazard change, we can manage it in some way or uh, the vulnerability change, but not that radical change in, in exposure. We're seeing informal migration, but soon there's going to have to be a, a, a more of a reckoning around where we want to live uh, and, and where we want not to live. And that, uh, that discussion at the moment is happening in the wings and not really in the mainstream. But increasingly, we will, we will see that become a, a center stage of thinking, let's, let's think about our exposure uh, element and where, as, as a key 
key response. And that will be the radical change when we start thinking not about the vulnerability and the hazard, but uh, th that exposure too. Uh, thanks a lot. And the final question goes to Imelda. Here in Glasgow today and these days where we have uh, been around, we have started to discuss quite uh, to a large extent nature-based solutions. So I see that coming on the big front, at least in the discussions here in Glasgow. Now my question to you is, do you see that also in your part of the world when it comes to investments in nature-based solutions? Over to you, Imelda. Oh yes, very much so. Uh, <laughs> Nature-based solution is very much a catch a catchphrase. Although we have gotten wind of the a bit of debate amongst the G77 today on on acceptability of nature-based solutions, and of course there are some critics. But in anticipation of acceptability and relevance of nature-based solutions, I would like to share that the ASEAN the ASEAN group, especially the food, agriculture, forestry sector, have readied itself and has already been preparing with the support of technical agencies to create a nature-based solutions guidelines for the 10 member states. Um, candidly, I think it will be um, a pre prerequisite of any funding support in the coming years. And so there might be a big push and support for more push for nature-based solutions. But um, some of the short practice, uh, simple practices being promoted within the region, such as, let's say, traditional knowledge from Thailand on underground damming are, are actually very nature-based. So I think it will stay and it will be promoted. So that brings us to an end of this session. And I think we have learned, I have learned a lot of uh, all the reflections and know-how from our eight panelists uh, and also the speakers in this event. And we have covered a lot of ground from risks, uh, fires, uh, flooding, uh, droughts, uh, future, global, uh, natural-based solutions, etc., etc. So I think uh, we have learned a lot and we will bring that with us. And I know that one of our partners or the main partner arranging this session is the Global Center for Adaptation based in Rotterdam, uh, Netherlands. And they will continue to build on and refine the elements of a strategic framework for enhancing water resilience in national climate policy that we have been discussing here. And you are all welcome to co-organize and also to, well, uh, join efforts with the Global Center for Adaptation in Rotterdam. With that, I thank you so much, you in attendance here in Glasgow and you who are attending from uh, overseas uh, worldwide. Thanks a lot from Glasgow.